You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. But it was, it was, a, it was just like a mixture of emotions, you know, it was obviously a little bit, a little bit frightening. Um, but, you know, the excitement and the adrenaline and it was just like, it was just a, it was just chaos. And I think um, that's sort of like the, the way my life was going, chaos. And I was, just, I was just attracted to it. I was attracted to the togetherness as well of, of all the lads, you know. Everybody's got skeletons or closets. Everybody's got things that we're ashamed of and embarrassed of. But that's fucking life. Like, yeah. We live, we learn, and we grow, I believe. I was talking to Wells, you know, I was, I was actually visualising, just sat there for days, thinking people was coming and going and I was talking away to myself. It was, um, suppose if anyone would have seen me then, fucking straitjacket. I remember Birmingham brought fucking hundreds and hundreds once. Um, I think it was their anniversary or something. This one was at the Etihad Day, I think it was about 2007. Um, and there was about 50 of us out and we just fucking looked at them all and just went, there was about fucking 700 of them. And I just thought, wow, that's, that's a firm that. It was an FA Cup game, we'd just been knocked out of the FA Cup. Well, just about to get knocked out of the FA Cup. Um, yeah, so Divide decided to jump on a pitch with a boiler suit on. Tried to uh, get the match abandoned. What happened? Um, I just got chased all over the pitch. <laughs> um, you know, with a boiler suit on? With a boiler suit on. Um, ended up, <laughs> got chased into the opposite end, into all the Blackburn fans and got a little bit of a kick in there off him. I look at there was you, man, bastard, and got fucking bottles of fucking coke and all sorts of me. Ended up getting dragged out by a copper, so I'll save me there. I'm at, I was at my wits end. Um, the suicidal force was coming in. And I had to fucking sort of like dig deep and think, you know, it's, it's either you sink or swim now, and you know. Um, you know, but I knew I knew he had to put the beer and the drugs down. I had to stop it. How would you feel that if you took your daughter to a match and, and it just erupted with violence between fans, like and your daughter was in the middle of it? How would you feel genuinely? Yeah, I'd be, I'd be fucking fuming, you know what I mean? Yeah, I'd be like, frightening, you know, obviously you don't want to take your kids and, you know what I mean, see them. Boom, we're on. It's today's <laughs> guest. We've got Anthony Vivian. Vivian. Vivian, Vivian yeah. yeah. It's a mad yeah. sick name, bro. <laughs> mad in there, yeah. yeah. So, a bit of a reputation. Uh, Manchester football hooligan, Man yeah. City. Kind of wobbled in life, drink, drugs, yeah. violence. Turned it around. Now you've kind of turned pro boxer. It's I have, a yeah. Good thing to see, bro. Yeah, a bit mad, yeah. A little bit crazy, a bit of a crazy journey, but yeah, here I am, yeah. That's what makes you, it. Well, yeah, that's it, definitely, yeah. First of all, how are you, brother? Yeah, I'm good, thank you, mate, yeah, good, thanks. How is, um, how's life just now? Yeah, it's good, mate, yeah, it's good, um, you know, um, just, um, just like I say, just like Christmas with the family and what have you, so, uh, yeah, it's all good. All quiet good times. times? Quite well, yeah, quiet, you know, busy, but, but good. Good, Keeping mate. Busy, but good, yeah. Always go back to the start for my guests. Yeah. Where yeah. you grew up, how it all began. Well, yeah, uh, well, a few miles north of here, uh, Miles Platin in, uh, in Manchester, um, born in 83 so it was um, sort of um, a bit of a depression at the time um, you know run, really run down area um, sort of like before Manchester started to get to get done up you know before the bombing and what have you um, born with my mum and dad um, but they, they they split up when I was a, a young age um, so then I ended up living with my nana and my granddad who then, who then took me on full time um, so they brought me up in, uh, in Mars Platin, yeah. Bit of a bit of a mad road, um, Mars Platin. There was um, plenty of characters on there. Um, bit of a, you know, it was a rough estate. Um, so yeah, sort of like um, just grew up there. It was a it was a big red area as well, big Man United area, um, which is a bit mad because for some reason I started to follow Man City, uh, so I went right against the, against the grain sort of thing. Um, Why? Don't know. There was always probably something a little bit different about me. Um, I think one of the things um, I remember watching a game. Remember watching the game, um, watching City when I, at a really young age, um, and that sort of sort of turned me. Um, but I remember when I was about seven years old, um, my uncle, who was sort of like you know married into the family, um, he took me to Main Road, the old the old City ground when it was all the old terracing. Um and I just remember going in there with the old Kipax. Um, and the experience, and it, it was just something I'll never forget, you know, the noise, the roar, and and just the sort of like the togetherness, and bang, was hooked from that moment on. How was it being, uh, leaving your mum and dad? Um, 
Did they have their own battles? Yeah, definitely. Um, definitely. Uh, my mum, basically, from from what from what I know, uh, my mum had had an accident, um, and she was unable to look after me. Um, and then sort of like she started to turn to the drink a little bit, um, and she was she was alcoholic. Um, they both moved on and had um, you know, I've got brothers and sisters on both my mum and dad's side, um, and they both sort of like moved on. But I've always he always kept in touch with him. My dad, my dad's still alive, still you know, still in contact with my dad. Got a relationship with my dad, and I, I did with my mum. But my, unfortunately, my mum passed away at an early age through the drink. Um, Sorry to hear that. Yeah, um, so that sort of affected me in a in a, in a bit of a way. Um, but yeah, so I mean, it, it, that sort of like turned me to the drink as well. And did that affect you? Yeah, uh, definitely. Did you start drinking? What age did you start drinking? Probably started um, around about 13, 14, just as, as most of the kids did on the estate. Um, you just go into the park, you know, a few mates from school and what have you done on a Friday. Um, and that's how it started. Um, as I got a bit older, 14, 15, it went on to the next day as I was getting into the football, you know. Um, going to the football, it's, you know, it's all, it's all around the day in the pub, in it, you know. Um, so around about 15, you know, I had no problem getting served. Um, so you know, I was walking into the pubs near near City's old ground, getting served on the you know, so I was and I was on the aisle. Fifteen, yeah, fifteen, sixteen, yeah. What age did you start getting into the fighting culture? Um, I was probably on the fringes, round the, just round about that age, from about sixteen, seventeen. I sort of like, I mean, I remember um, I was talking not long back. There was a game against Leeds. Um, I think it was about ninety nine, and, and I was I was I was still at school at the time. Um, and it was just chaos outside, you know, um, charging battles and, you know, Brits getting slung into coaches and remember the van getting turned over. Um, and I was about 15, 16 at the time, yeah. And I know it was only on the fringes, um, but it was like my first bit of a taste of, of the football the football scene, really. Were you ever fighting beforehand? Yeah, I was always, I was always in, you know, from, from growing up, from being, a, from being a kid, I was always fighting, in, you know, in little bits of trouble in school or at home on the estate. There's always, um, always, always getting into a little bit of miver. Mischief. Yeah. What was it like being in your first scrap in the football games? Um, it's sort of like it, it, it come on a little bit slow because obviously, sort of like on the on the fringes and being a bit, you know, being a bit younger. Um, I was just on the fringes for a long time. Um, but it was it was, a, it was just like a mixture of emotions, you know. It was obviously a little bit, a little bit frightening. Um. But you know the excitement and the adrenaline, and it was just like it was just a it was just chaos. And I think um, that's sort of like the the way my life was going chaos. And I was just I was just attracted to it. I was attracted to the togetherness as well of, of all the lads. You know, it felt normal. Plus, you felt as if you had a family. For... Yeah, it felt like a um, like I say, you know, sort of like growing up with me, with my grandparents and and not with um, you know with my dad. And it was just a little, a little bit. A little bit confused, I suppose, growing up, um, not really knowing where you belong and what have you. So, for the first time, probably felt like I belonged somewhere, um, and and probably felt a bit attached to such, you know, attachment to it. So, yeah, that was um, that's pretty much where it come from, really. Who was top boy in Manchester at that time? Uh, probably when I was going. Um, <clears throat> well, I don't know who the top boy was at the time. It's, it was it not long after the the governors had just been smashed and what have you. Um, you know, there's people like Rodney Roden, who's got um he's got a book out on governors, um, people like Cooper, Trav, you know, um, people like Pat Better, um, they they was all sort of like um I think they just just at the end of their banning orders and just coming back. And what was that like in the nineties, like going to the games? Um oh, it was, it was brilliant. It was such you know, it was um such a buzz to go. I mean, at the time city was crap, city was shit, you know. Um Did that make things worse? Do you know <clears throat> From going now to going back then when we shit, it was I found it a real buzz, you know. The um it was like real, real uh, devotion to the club. You know, it was it was probably the worst time in the club's history when I you know when I started coming through. Um but it's such a buzz, you know. We was going to mad places, we we're going to Walsall and Grimsby, you know. Um Macclesfield, I remember getting beat off Stockport County, you know, it was it was mad, but um you know, just just to be there and 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 feel that sort of buzz and emotion, it was un unbelievable. Does it become such a buzz that you just look forward to a game, never mind <clears throat> the result, but just to fight? Well, yeah, just just it was just um, it consumed my life really for years, for for like fifteen years. It was just, you know, 
you sort of thought about all week, you know, and you've seen big games coming up in the fixture list and you was like, you know, planning for that and it just, yeah, it just consumes your life, yeah. How many are in a firm? How many was in the Manchester firm? Um, in Man City's firm, I mean, on a, on a good day, I've, I've seen like, I've seen up to 300 of us down at West Ham, um, you know, but sometimes it could be only 30 of us and it just depends on the day, really. What was it like then when Man U played Man City? Was is it as... Because obviously the old, old firm in Glasgow is yeah. fucking ruthless. Celtic Rangers, like yeah. the hatred is pure yeah. still to this day. But what's it like with the Manchester derby? Is it pure, pure hatred? Yeah, it's definitely, definitely pure hatred. I mean, I know a lot of United fans have always said, you know, Liverpool's their main game, what have you. But, you know, I think the Manchester lads, you know, they, they definitely, there's definitely a lot of hatred there, especially from the blue half. Um, and it's it sort of, you know, it gets built up from the week before. You know what I mean? Um even even um, when they're not playing each other, you know, there's um, there's, a, there's always times, you know, you're waiting for each other in town or you bump into each other um, and it'll go off. Even just if there's no football on, you know, it could pop off. If you're out of City and out United and you bump into each other, it could go off again anytime. How was it though in Manchester? They were at the peak then, the 90s. In the 90s, yeah. So they were winning everything. Like, yeah, there was, yeah. Does that play a ma major factor as well that like, from people? And it's, it's such schoolboy stuff like yeah. that the kind of point scoring but if they're winning everything does that make you more angry towards them I suppose it's the old saying you, I mean the Carlos are better blues don't they mm. um, yeah and it was it was hard it was, I mean especially where I grew up in North Manchester it's, it, that's the red area of Manchester so um, it was hard yeah, it was hard you know knowing that city you know we was in the third tier of football and they just won the treble in 99 it, it, was, it was tough yeah yeah, it must be my game. Yeah, it was, it was tough, yeah. Because <laughs> we went through it all. I'm a Celtic man and Rangers won everything when yeah, I was younger. Yeah. Fucking everything. And <laughs> at school, and it's constantly point scoring. It's constantly that, yeah. people pushing your buttons. So when it everything goes full circle eventually. Yeah, of course. So yeah. when things start turning and it's kind of payback. But yeah. obviously with the fighting kind of side of things, like, did you just become so absorbed by it that you didn't even see anything else that just wanted to fight but like, was that a passion every um, game to set up fights and then go and have a tear up um, I mean firstly I mean <clears throat> I think growing up I, I was the first thing was well, I was a football fan and I was a City fan um, but yeah I suppose as I got older and I got more involved um, it, it did sort of like just become you know that's that's what I, that's what I wanted you know just the attraction of the violence and the chaos and, and meeting the lads and the organising and everything you know it just sort of like just some, you know, it's it, it was at the forefront of my mind all week, you know, leading up to a game. Um, and it did, yeah, it did consume a lot of my time up and a lot of my thoughts, yeah. What about when uh, Liverpool came? Did it was there much hatred towards them as much as um, you to did, Liverpool? There's, there's, there's pro I mean, <clears throat> even with Liverpool and Everton, <clears throat> um, there's a Manchester Scouts thing which goes back years ago, you know, from dates back from from the old ship canal when that was you know when that was sorted and and then he, you know the jobs over the docks and what have you and it just stems back from them so yeah there's, there's a Manchester Liverpool rivalry anyway no matter who's playing now um, I suppose the big one has always been United and Liverpool um, but even you know City play Everton you know it's always a, the possibility it can pop off yeah you always watch Carragher and Neville always at it man. yeah yeah always yeah. fucking at each other's throats <laughs> who's the toughest firm you've come up against um, I don't know really. There's a lot in the day. Um, I know Birmingham always. They were always brought up. Zulu's. A, Zulu's always brought a good, a good firm to City. Um, Leeds have. Um, you know, obviously we've we've had a lot of runnings with United. You know, um, a lot of the, you know the South the South Yorkshire team, Sheffield United, and Barnsley. You know, they're they're, they're you know the tough lads on the day. You know, um, and obviously you know the, the London lot as well. You know, um, Tottenham have always been up there. West Ham. You know, and obviously Millwall. Um, but on, on the day, I mean, I suppose the worst kicking I've had was off United. But, you know, I've had that many battles with them, I've lost count. Um, They'll be loving that. He says that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I've had a few boys on who used to fight in the football scene and they says Middlesbrough were fucking nutcases. Middlesbrough, yeah. I remember Middlesbrough coming down in the 90s um, and even coming it's at the old main road ground and even coming in the half stand, yeah. Um, but they was they they was like like never had big big numbers, but you know if they brought fifth there, it was it was a top fifth there. Did you ever come across Millwall? Millwall, I was a bit young, a bit young for when for we played them. Um, but I remember them, the the game the infamous game at Main Road when they come up with Chelsea. In fact, um, teamed up and it was on the McIntyre program. Um, but yeah, I was there at the game. Um, there weren't really much. There was that many. You know, the the, the police was 
you know, was in heavy police presence that day. So there was not really much. Um, you weren't really, you couldn't really get at each other. But you know, he went off in the ground. He went off down the curry mile afterwards and what have you. Um, but yeah, I was there that day. Was it? I was, I was about 15, 15 that time. What's the one thing that stands out in your mind when you you had a terror? What's the one thing you said I really enjoyed that or that was close to fucking um, death? Or? Yeah, but I mean, I've, I've been in a few bad injuries. One with again with United. Um, it, you know that was bad. I got hit with an hammer in the mouth, and, um, split me, split my lips, and not not tell my teeth right through my gum. And I was sparkled on the floor. I got a right kick in. Um, you know, there was um, one of our lads was ended up in a, you know in a coma. Um, it was that bad. You know, I remember the police sealed the area off for twenty four hours forensics. Um, that's probably the worst one. Um, but yeah, we've had loads of loads of you know maddens where it's just gone. You know, just gone. I remember being at Sheffield United one. One time and just it was mad. We just all come out the ground and it just went completely erupted outside the ground and we ended up back in the stadium, you know, over the seats and whatever. It was um, just there's there's that many. I can't you know can't even really remember off the top of my head. Does that ever make you question it though and thinking what is it I'm fighting for? Definitely these days. Um, I think you know I've been really lucky. I mean I've not been to prison. You know, um, luckily enough I've not been seriously hurt where you know it's it's sort of like affected me my, my life. Um, so de definitely, you know, it's um, definitely question myself now. You know, it's, it's you know, but young and dumb, isn't it? You just yeah, it's, like no. you say, coming from the broken home and what if you're part of a family and the violence is an adrenaline rush in itself. Never yeah. mind having a brotherhood that people have got your back. Yeah, no definitely. matter if you're outnumbered or not. And that nowadays yeah. is is second to none. That like, nobody's yeah. really got your back anymore. It's changed days from the way it was probably in the 80s, 90s when I speak to people that's what they kind of say there was a lot yeah. more loyalty there was a lot more trust nowadays it's kind of everything's upside down yeah definitely yeah um, like I say I mean I still see a couple of lads and what have you now I and mean, I don't think it's you know it's, I mean I say it's you know it's it's you know there's still lads that are active now and you know it's it's, it's just West Ham and Tottenham the other day he was going off there see outside that. that line yeah so um, you know it's, I don't think it's ever going to go away never going to go away you know there's always going to be lads coming through but that's just it's tribalism as well people just want to feel like part of a unit a part of something and yeah. they're willing to do whatever it takes and listen if people want to have a scrap have a scrap as long as families and shit yeah. don't really get involved and other people get hurt because obviously you've got kids now going to the game and, yeah. and that's the thing that women children like, yeah. and if you don't want people caught up in the crossfire especially yeah. if people are coming off tube stations and all that shit and then there's riots because Innocent people can potentially yeah, get hurt. Of course, can yeah, definitely. How did it? How was it arranged back then? Um, mobile phone, really. Oh, mobile phone. Or um, you know, we sort of. Um, I mean, I used to go and speak to him. Used to speak to a lot of lads. You know, especially if there was local or some would always have a number. You'd ring up. You know, you tell people to make their way up to where I would get a phone call and say, "Head for such a place." Um, or sometimes, you know, you could just end up getting off the train somewhere, walk, you know, and then you, you just bump into there lot and that was it, you know. Um, Were you ever set up? I um, don't think we was really ever set up, no. Um, we've, you know, we've probably, um, probably been told to come somewhere, you know, with such, you know, certain amount of numbers or whatever, and we've totally outnumbered and we've got no chance or what have you, but, you know, that's just part of parcel of it, I suppose, isn't it? So just all bragging rights for who gets wins and who chases each other, who, how does it, it Win, how does it function if you win? So, say if you chase a fun, yeah, is that at use of win, or um, is there any ever just come to right? Okay, it's just a fair result, everybody just kind of walks away. What's the final whistle kind of thing when it comes to the end of the fight? I suppose every, everyone who's there is going to have a different say on it, aren't they? You know, um, because sometimes it could be six or one half a dozen or the other, sometimes you could have a right result and just you know, they've got them on the toes. Other times, you know, they've got you on your toes, you know what I mean? It's just, um. It's just one of them, I suppose, yeah. How's that Probably. feeling, though, getting put on your toes? Yeah, it's not good. It's not good at all, you know what I mean? Um, sort of like, you, you feel, as a man, you know, you feel, you've, you've been beat, I suppose, haven't you? So, it's never a good feeling. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so, when did the drink the drugs start to take its toll on you? Um, well, I started drinking, at, like I say, around about 15 for him 15 um, and it was getting heavier and heavier obviously with the football it was turning into two days by the time I was 16 I was drinking Friday and I sat there um, and then as I got into my teens it was like Friday, Saturday, Sunday um, 
then the, the sort of like the drugs, the drugs was on the scene, then at the football, um, the cocaine, it was it was everywhere. Um and it sort of sort of then it was it was coming in, so it was like a Friday night, then a Saturday night again. And I suppose um, as I got into my early twenties, I suppose deep down I realised I had, you know, I probably had a little bit of a problem. Um you know, start doing it by yourself and what have you. Um and then when I was 24, that's when me my mum, my mum passed away um with the drink. But instead of you know, instead of sort of like learning by her mistakes, I sort of went the other way and it just um I just ended up on a bit of a spiral then. Um, you know, it was it was like in the week, cocaine in the morning, you know, drinking in the morning. Um and it's you know, it ended up ended up in a bit of a bad way with it. Um, you know, relationship broke down, lost my job, um, ended up back at my nana's house. Um and it was sort of like my first um my first downward spiral really. Um where, you know, it was just complete chaos, you know, just sort of like felt like I was losing everything around me, losing the plot. Did you see a lot of yourself in your mum? Yeah, definitely. Um I mean my nana used to say that to me all the time, you know, you you know you you just remind me so much of your mum, you know what I mean? She was a bit erratic and um and what have you. Um yeah, and probably had a lot of the traits, yeah. Um I mean a lot a lot of our families, you know, they all suffer with some sort of addiction, whether it's drink, drugs or or what have you, you know, so maybe a bit of um bit of bit of something in the genes as well. Yeah, it's sad, man. My family was the same. It was a mixture of everything. I kinda got everything, I kinda took yeah. bits of everything like but it's a it's a weird thing, addiction. Like no doubt if you've never really battled I think everybody's got an addiction to some degree, yeah. but if you've never really battled with it to an extent where people who take coke and get yeah. if I see people full of coke now, I, I think, what are you fucking doing? Like yeah. but if somebody told me that in my twenties, I'd have told them to fuck off. Yeah. So it's difficult. Yeah. There comes a realisation in your life when you go, nah, something needs to change. Like, yeah. A lot of people don't get that. A lot, a lot of people might get it, but it's just so hard to change that. Like, yeah losing your mum and losing your job and losing your partner and yet we can sit in a room and sniff our brains out and yeah. and we're willing to lose everything because of a powder to make it makes us feel good for six hours. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a constant chasing it. It's it's it is pure madness. Like it's madness. how we we accept that. Like yeah. how I accepted it and all for so long. Like how and why you, you like now I question it like how many years I wasted yeah. through the madness. But then again, I look at the other hand as well. Like I've learned a lot. Yeah, I've yeah. learned a lot. Like I became a better individual. Of, like everybody's got skeletons or closets. Everybody's got things that we're ashamed of and embarrassed of. But that's fucking life. Like yeah, we live, we learn, and we grow. I believe. But when you were going down that slope, like when did you have any breakdowns or suicidal thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean that was sort of like my first rock bottom, really, with my mum. Um, and then there was, there was, you know, there was, there was times. Sort of after that as well, you know, it was, it was just a constant battle. I was on, I was off, on and off. Um, um, you know, and it was sort of like I was I used to call myself a secret cokehead, you know, because I, I just and I'd keep it on the quiet, and I thought nobody knew. Do you know what I mean? But it, it was obvious that everybody around me sort of like knew there was a problem. Um, you know, and I'd sit there in pain. You know, every time, every time, you know, I'd, I'd sit there in pain, thinking, you know, what am I doing? You know, I need to stop. I can't. You know, but and I just couldn't. Um. And sort of my, my second sort of my second sort of rock bottom was um you know my my second relationship was coming to an end you know that was you know it ended up turning toxic um at the same time my nana was my nana had just been diagnosed that she had cancer she hadn't got long um so I was struggling again um you know and and we went went to the house we all the family was there and we watched her pass away there in, in the bed um and that sort of turned me head again you know it was like I felt like just the fact that was it, you know, I was really on my own then. Um, with, within a you know, few weeks later, you know, my relationship again I broke down and he ended up staying in, in my nana's house. You know, there was no one, my auntie was there. We shouldn't have been there. We were squatting, basically. Um, and I just completely lost my head, yeah. Um, just drinking myself to oblivion. Um, cocaine, you know, um, for days and days on end um, to the point where I was hallucinating. Um, I was, you know, I was talking to walls, you know, I was I was actually visualising, just sat there for days, thinking people was coming and going and was talking away to myself. It was, um, I suppose if anyone would have seen me then, fucking straight jacket. 
Yeah, psychotic shit. Psychotic shit, and and that's the point it got me to. Yeah. Did um, nobody? Did people know the telltale signs that how bad you were? Or did uh, you cover it up that well and kept well, just, hide I just, away? I just couldn't move out of the house. I was just my head was completely gone. I was stuck in this house for weeks. Um, I sort of like got out of that psychotic mode, um, and somehow managed to keep a job down. Um, I don't know how because you know I was in some states at the time. Um, but yeah, and I, I was end up I was actually sleeping in the bed where I mean, where I just watched my nana pass away. So it was like it was torture. I was just I cried myself to sleep most of the time if that's if I even went to sleep, you know. Um, and just yeah, I just remember just being in real bad pain, you know. I want I want to be I want able to have my kids there at the house. So I was, I was losing that bond with my kids. Um, and just yeah, it was just yeah. I ended up getting to the point where I thought, you know. I can't, I'm going to get out of this and that's when the suicidal thoughts come in and you know it was the only way I thought you know I, did, I just couldn't live with the pain that I was in it was just torture um, but on the other hand I couldn't stop you know I'd swear off it I'd say I need to stop I need to stop but then within a few hours bang I was, I was straight back on it it was just like it was a constant battle with it um, yeah and, and, and at the time I just thought the only way the only way you know if I, if I can't stop this now I'm going to have to end it it's scary man because well I used to glorify drug dealers we yeah. used to glorify drug people still do you watch the films and you think wow I want that life but if somebody's in a house losing their mind suicidal yeah. people are still willing to feed you gear yeah because they don't give a fuck no, they don't they. care whether you die or not they don't care if you're lying beside your gran and your mum no. in the next grave they don't fucking genuinely care but yet we thought that was normal but yeah. to hang well I, I did like, yeah. I, I've sold graft in the past like mm. I never gave a fuck no. about anybody Um, and then it's once you start getting older you start realising that fucking how deranged it is yeah. people who take it and the people who sell it like how deranged it actually is to yeah. destroy lives to benefit your own to people sitting in gaffs taking drugs losing their families losing their loved ones uh, just feeling pure shame and yeah. guilt and yeah. it's a life of fucking misery it's yeah. so painful that like, it's a life of we're already in fucking pain anyway do you know what I mean so why not try and enjoy it by doing good things I believe I can say that now because I'm in a good place but I do I do think about the past a lot yeah. and I think fuck me like how fucking to tune to the moon I was man yeah it's unbelievable yeah well, to get there did you stop going to the football when you you were on at that yeah I've probably stopped a, a, a while before that really to be honest with you um, why did you give up on that I was just in those states to, to mix to start like stop mixing with people and sort of like become very secluded to myself um, sort of like went sort of lost myself really went very within myself um, you know um, I used to have a part time job doing the doors as well all around Manchester and what have you that come to an end um, a lot of things really I was, at the time I was doing um Started a bit of unlicensed boxing as well, doing unlicensed boxing. Um, and then obviously, just to say it was in, I was in no no states for even getting the gym. Because you bloomed up, you not about 19, 20 stone um, at one point? Yeah, well, it was just before, and I ended up blowing up right up to 19 stone, yeah. Really, really out of shape. I mean, I was, I was a big lad, um, sort of like from my late teens up until around about the age of 30. Um, but then, sort of like just completely lost, went out of shape, you know. Um, just the lifestyle went really out of shape bloomed up to 19 stone what was it like working on the doors in Manchester Um, crazy crazy especially so many early days yeah did you enjoy that though because of the fighting background Um, yeah it was um, it, 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 it was it was enjoyable we had the, I've got some mad memories you know um, and like again other times you know come come a bit unstuck you know um, it sort of like dragged me into sort of like murky underworld as well you know where um, I was probably a bit, little bit out of my depth to be honest with you um, but yeah, definitely had some frightening moments there. Uh, you know, look, look, lucky to sort of like be alive. One of us, you know, so many, so many incidents on the doors. There's some, uh, some, some characters out there in Manchester, didn't there? Nah, they just come down with a fucking banger, man, and just definitely put that. one in your head. Yeah, like, yeah. same as Glasgow, Liverpool. Like, yeah, yeah. Leeds, Newcastle. In fact, every fucking city, every, every city, is wild, got a, like, yeah, yeah, everybody's yeah. got a trigger, man. Yeah. Like, Definitely. You don't know who the fuck you're dealing with because you don't know everybody in your city. No, default. And it's always a little fucking asshole so you wouldn't expect it. You throw them down the stairs and then they're back yeah. with a fucking shotgun. Yeah, exactly, mate. Yeah, exactly that, yeah. And it's... My old man was a bouncer in um, yeah. Glasgow and Victoria's and they were heavy-handed back in the day. Yeah. The bouncers used to give out proper fucking beatings. Like, yeah. My dad was quite respected in that way but obviously when people... He knew everybody in Glasgow but people used to come down 
they didn't fuck about. There was no much cameras in that then. Yeah. So people used to just come down with shooters, swords, and fucking go for it. <laughs> because they didn't realise my dad obviously new bouncers and stuff like yeah. cause shit and they think, What the fuck are you doing? Do you know who that is? And people going, No. And for you know what, their team handed down. Yeah. That's went it. to fucking kill. Yeah. What doors did you work on? Worked on a few man, worked on Sankey Salts before that was shut down. What was that like? It just depended, they had different nights and what have you. Um, I mean, we had the Rat Pack on, though. It was um, like everything fucking nutted out in Manchester and Salford. It was it was a bit crazy. I went a bit wild there one night. Um, remember a lot, a lot of the lads turned up, but it, funny enough, I actually knew him, you know what I mean? So I was all right, but he wanted to, wanted to like you say, he wanted to kill one of the other bouncers there, wanted to kill one of the other door lads. So he turned up, didn't know the doors was going in, motorbikes flying past and pff, cars turned up with, you know, a load of lads jumped out with ballys on and, Sort of like, but I knew who he was. I was sort of like trying to be that like the middleman, middleman. But you know, there was there was there was no stopping him. Not to kill this lad. Were you taking graft? Were you snorting gear while you're working? Yeah, that, plenty of times. Yeah, plenty of times I've been off my fucking head. Yeah, at work, it was mad. But it feels normal then, because you're in a it, fucking nightclub and you could get away with a lot more then. It was yeah, it was it was normal. Yeah, it was just normal. It was, it was, everyone was at it. You know, then look. Searching a lad to take a bit of gear off him, and that, you know, it was for us then. Do you think that's one of the reasons why you had the job? Because you could, you would get offered gear all the time. Uh, I used to give the, the bouncers gear, like, yeah, we gram here, and that, and you keep you sweet, keep you sweet, yeah, definitely, yeah. Um, there's probably a lot, probably one of the reasons, yeah, you know. Um, I was sort of like, I was out, I was out while I was earning money, I suppose, yeah, you know what I mean? Them to having, you know, a quick, quick drink at the bar and a bit of gear and what have you, and then, you know. How was it on the doors fighting for Manchester City? If any of the Reds came by, um, funny enough, I never actually never had a running with any of them while I was on the door. Um, I know a lot of the lads from City used to come to the doors I was working and used to let them in, like you know what I mean, on the, on the club and what have you. Um, but I never had no Reds turned up. Was that always a concern in your mind that a firm turned up because they knew where you worked, or was that kind of off the radar once the fights were done in the football matches? Then obviously, you said if you've seen each other, people still used to fucking go for it, but. Was there a real or anything like don't go to anybody's workplace or never go to their house? Um, well, you know, there's, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of rules that people say. You know, people say like, oh, don't don't come to your door, but they do. You know, um, I remember one point um, it got that bad with United, and it was it got a bit personal, and there was talks about people going to people's gaffs and what have you. Um, it started getting a bit silly. You know what I mean? It's it's football. You know, we're not you're not we're not fucking gangsters. You know what I mean? Um, so it, I think that that ended up getting sorted out. Um, but yeah, it's always a worry that it can go too far. You know what I mean? And and you know, boys will be boys, aren't they? Suppose mm -hmm. you know, they, 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 you know, they don't want to fucking stop there. <laughs> What's the biggest firm you've come up against when you were outnumbered? Um, I remember, I remember Birmingham brought fucking hundreds and hundreds once. Um, I think it was their anniversary or something. This one was at the Etihad. I think it was about two thousand and seven. Um, and there was about fifty of us out, and we just fucking looked at them all and just went. Pfft. There was about fucking seven hundred of them, and I just thought, "Wow, that's that's a firm that that is a fucking firm." <laughs> I've had big Baz Barrington on, and he's a fucking nutcase. Like he's yeah. world champion kickboxer. Yeah, like, yeah. I've seen him. Whether you've got a firm of two hundred and he's standing there himself, just still going <laughs> skeptically fucking charging him because I'd imagine that. Like, like, every, every guy I've had on who's who's been involved in a football yeah. scene, like everyone's been fucking sound I must yeah. admit they've all been sound yeah. like every single one from Tottenham West Ham Birmingham um, they've just all been at Everton they had big Andy Nichols and it's just uh, diamonds man like yeah. just nice like you wouldn't even think it like a, a lot of people it gets a hard ride as well people are oh, why are you find it football this and that but you've got to understand the backstory all these people the majority of them all come from broken homes yes you've got choices to make but when you've got a feeling of fam like everybody's what, involved in gangs, well, from the streets anyway, you're kind of involved in a little gang and you just love your friends, you're willing to do what it takes. Like, people in the fighting scene as well, like, they all struggle. They're all kind of fucking mad bastards, mentally. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it, it's true, but like, but they're all sound as fuck. Like, every single one have been all diamonds and I'm still friends with every single one. Yeah. Like, just all brand new. Obviously, there's some words exchanged um, with them still, but... I don't take fuck all to do with that. I'm just there to learn their stories. And, yeah, yeah. But you'll tend to see that they're all 100%. Yeah. Every single one. All fucking brilliant. Yeah, I mean, people always say, I mean, you know, people, I mean, people do look down on, on, on sort of like football lads, you know, and you think, well, you know, what, what are you doing? You need those jobs. But, um, 
do you yeah, like you say, do, do, you know, some of the most, you know, respectable men out there, you know what I mean? They do do anything for you, do anything to help anybody. Um it's just that, you know, the little things that they have that that like, inkling to, to go towards a football of violence, you know. Did you ever team up with other people and fight for England? No, I've I've never I've been to watch England, um, but never really um never really been on the England scene. Um I noticed I've you no, know, I remember a few times in the early two thousands, um when they played at Old Trafford, um, and it was just going off everywhere, different firms, you know, you know, it was just everywhere all over Manchester, Derby and Bolton was fighting, then the next thing is we're having it with Stoke and then it was just fucking chaos everywhere, yeah. Just our firms fighting with each other. Against each other? I just against each other, yeah. Because you always see World Cups, Euros, England fans are, are, are always causing it. Yeah, yeah. Why do you think that? Is that because it's so... Um, right here with it? Yeah, maybe, just yeah. Just take it abroad. Like, every news channel, you know yourself, in England yeah. they're fighting, there's fucking chairs and tables. Yeah, yeah, definitely. They do cause it. Definitely. It's, it's definitely, um, it's, well, it's like the old, they used to call it, didn't they? The old English disease. Um, I know it's spread far and wide now over Europe and what have you, but even there, they still model themselves on, on, on the English or the British, I suppose. Um, you know, the, the, the hooligan elements, they, they, just, they do model themselves on sort of like the 80s and the 90s, the British hooligan. Yeah. It's, it's a bit mad, yeah. Did you ever go abroad? No, no, I've never, never been abroad to watch England, no. Um, and obviously, while City have been in Europe, obviously I've been on banning orders. I've only just got off my banning order now, just just not long ago. <laughs> um, so, so I think I was, I think in in a, in, a, in about twelve or thirteen year span, I was banned for like ten years with a little gap in between, just kept getting lifted and banned. So, what was the first banning order you got? The first one was not far. It was at Bolton. Um, that was sort of a bit of disorder there. Um, ended up just getting a three year banning order for a, for. A, Little minor scuffle, um, and then I think I ended up getting done for police assault and something else as well during it. What was the one you invaded the pitch and you've got the fucking boiler suit on? That was um, Blackburn, that was Blackburn, I think that was about 2007 as well. Um, it was an FA Cup game, we'd just been knocked out of the FA Cup, well, just about to get knocked out of the FA Cup. Um, yeah, so they decided to jump on a pitch with a boiler suit on, try to uh, get the match abandoned. What happened? Um, I just got chased all over the pitch. <laughs> um, you know, with the um, boiler suit on. With a boiler suit on. Um, ended up, <laughs> got chased into the opposite end, into all the Blackburn fans, and got a little bit of a kick in there off him. All I got there was you, man, bastard, and fucking bottles of fucking coke and all sorts of stuff. Ended up getting dragged out by a copper, so I'll save me really. Um, but funny enough, I didn't even get a banning order for that. I didn't get a banning order for that one. It's um, got a bit of an heavy fine. Is that a... Uh heartbreaking thing getting a banning order not able to support your team or is that a relief to think fuck me I'm taking a break from that um, at the time no it was um, yeah it was heartbreaking you know um, it's, and it's a lot of like, like, lads to tell you on banning orders it's the ring with all like you've got to go and, and your passport in when every time there's a, there's a match abroad and you've got to sign on and um, so it's just a real inconvenience for you that's fucking mad, do not it? Like, yeah. When you think about it, how do you feel when like, you, you talk about it, like running on with boiler suits? Like, um, were you were you mad with it then? Uh, yeah, I was just mad with it. It's just, it, it was my life at the time. Um, I thought it was, you know, young dickhead, thought it was, <laughs> young dickhead full of beer and drugs, I thought it was great, you know what I mean? Yeah. Obviously, you still look back now and you think, fucking hell, it's a bit cringy. But like you say, you know, it's, it's, it's who you was, it's who you was, and it's not who you are now. Yeah, you look at those firms abroad like the Italians and the the Polish and yeah. the Dutch, like they are they cunts are ruthless, man. Yeah, definitely. I know um I'm in contact with quite a few Dutch from Feyenoord. They they come over and watch City and we go over there as well. Um but they're all fucking massive as well. They're like Vikings, you yeah. know. They're all seven foot and fucking sweaty stone. You're thinking, fucking hell. <laughs> so, MMA fighters. Oh, fucking, yeah, uh, yeah. And you think, wow, yeah. It's even because Manchester City is so fucking, it's went international now, it's kind of yeah. a global team, like they're one of the most richest clubs in the world. Like, yeah. Do you find that a lot more people are then want to get involved? Um, it's definitely changed now. When I go to City now, it's not how it was years ago when I was going. Um, the fan base has changed. It's, um, we used to slag United off for it, you know, for being a tourist club. Um, but, with, with this is what happens, you know, the money comes in, the trophies come in and people sort of like jump on the bandwagon. Um, so City's sort of like gone that way now as well. How do you see that? Because I had Bill Gardner on, top boy from West Ham and he was heartbroken that they changed their stadium and, and things like that happened because they're 
so loyal to their club that yeah. they just want it London born and bred but to grow as a club and to grow as a business do you get do you understand that side of it yeah definitely I mean um I love Main Road. I'd love, you know, I loved it. The atmosphere there was great. You know, it was, um, you know, you was close to the pitch. It was, a, it was a proper, you know, it was a proper old ground. Um, but you know, like you say, you got to move with the times, I suppose. Um, you know, if you, and if 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 you look back, if City would have stayed there, and you know, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have been where we are now. We wouldn't have been in Champions League finals and winning Premier League. You know, we might have still been in the, you know, in the Championship or something like that. You don't yeah. know. How was it when what? Like, Oasis were coming through the ranks and they were massive City fans did that give does that give you a boost yeah it was great we because they're fucking know. worldwide man they're yeah, legends yeah they, they, you know it was great I remember um, at, like you say at the time in the 90s when Oasis was, was at the best um, United was doing everything the City was shit and you should have put up daft arguments like oh, well you know you, you could be a fucking red you know you've got me cut no we've got Liam Gallagher <laughs> you know what I mean just daft shitty arguments uh, so. it's fucking so childish isn't yeah it? really childish mate yeah but how did you get out of your misery then? How, when you're at your darkest and you're suicidal and you're on the coke every day, boozing every day, what was the turning point for you? Um, like I remember lying there for a, um, a few sort of like nights and sort of like, you know, realising, you know, I was at my wits end. Um, the suicidal thoughts was coming in and I had to fucking sort of like dig deep and think, you know, it's, it's either you sink or swim now, and, you know. Um, you know, but I knew, it, I knew I had to put the beer and the drugs down. I had to stop it. Um, I had to get out out my house, find somewhere to live, um, and I remember uh, I was working. I was working for a, a Sikh family at the time, um, Sings, um, and I just managed to say, "Listen, there's an house here to rent. You know, um, we can put you in it. If, you know." And it was like fucking hell. It was, and then I remember saying, "Right, well, I was getting, I got, I was getting in the house, um, and I dragged myself to um, a CA meeting, um, and I, and, I, and I went went to the CA meeting, listened to people talk, and I just sort of like." Oh, fucking hell, I was reminiscing with everything, you know, just sort of like connected with what people were saying. And I thought, fucking hell, you know, I've got, I've got a serious problem here. But I've seen people who was clean and they got out of the shit that I was in. So I, st I stuck with it and done, done the 12, the 12 step program. Um, and I remember, I remember thinking when I had got the keys to the house and I had, I had no furniture at all. I had, there was a bed there, I had a teller, um, and, and some pots and pans and plates. And I just thought, you know what, fuck it, just go with that now. Just go with what you've got. Just move in. Um, and I was still under the influence at the time when I got in there. And I remember just thinking, that's it now. Just get your fucking head down. And I, and I woke up the next day, and it was like um, it was like something had come over me. I thought, this is it now. This is where you know I'm turning the corner now. Um, and over the next few sort of like weeks and months, um, carried on with my meetings, carried on staying clean. When I used to kick my house out a little bit here and there, you know, the kids were staying. I was just, I just started building and building a miles better place. You know, when I thought, right, sort your head out now, I'm going to get fit. I was getting up, running in the morning, going back to the gym. I went back back to my boxing gym. Um, started fighting again, unlicensed. Um, and I just built on and built on from there. How many kids you got? I've got three kids. Ain't that the hard part though? Like, because I used to sit in gaffs and, I had kids and mm. I never gave a fuck. Yeah. I never cared. You, but you do, inside you do care, but you you clearly don't as well if you're doing the things that you do while you've got your blood there. Yeah. Dependent on you. Yeah. And that's the fucking heartbreaking thing that like missing the those years and that, like a kid actually fucking started giving me shit yesterday for some reason because I'd went with his cousin or something and he was obviously on it and then five minutes into it, he ends up asking for help. Yeah, just people are just it, it's weird the way people deal with madness differently and end up giving the, the kids some advice and hopefully it takes it but the first step is admitting you've got a problem because that one week turns into five years ten years yeah. before you know it you're, you think how the fuck did I get into this hole when the dark clouds are just so dark that yeah. you can't see any silver lining you can't see any sort of light to get out and to make that first jump is the scary part like going to eight, I've done AA meetings CA meetings eight fucking NA meetings, GA meetings, and it. I just wanted to dip my toe in them all. I was never an alcoholic, but there was probably stages in my life I probably did drink every day yeah. with the boys up the park or fucking hiding away in gaffs, and you don't mm -hmm. think it's a problem because I always kind of kept sharp. And once you start listening to other people's stories, you realise how identical everyone is. Yeah. 
how much a match that everybody in that room is like no matter what way you're looking because I used to look at people maybe on smack I think I'm not that bad that was my kind of get out of jail free a kind of free pass that I'm not quite there yet mm-hmm. I can still get a bird but I'm, all, I'm okay but when you actually sit and listen to people's stories no matter their appearance no matter how much money they has or how much you've lost that like, we're all the fucking same yeah how was that for you to take that first step for being a bit of a boy and having a bit of a reputation to then having fuck all losing the kids yeah. relationships breaking down left right and centre for then you to make that decision to say right I need to go and get help uh, well I've it, it was the rock bottom when you're rock bottom you, you just you're like there's nowhere to turn and I didn't have my nana there who'd always sort of like bailed me out of the shit and it's um, I remember listening to someone talking saying you know addiction it's it's a very selfish disease um, because like you just said you know even though you do care inside you're just acting out like you don't give a shit about people around you you know and, and deep down you do you do care um, but it's just that mentality what you have at the time you just you're not thinking about hurting people you're just thinking about um, just thinking about getting on it thinking about sort of taking yourself out out of you I suppose getting out of yourself um, and, and that's where that's where the problem was Um but yeah, for um, for me to go to the meeting, it was like you say, it was a bit hard at first because I didn't think I was sort of like, like you say, I never thought I was an alcoholic or, or an addict because it wasn't always every day. And I did have sort of like, you know, patches of sobriety and what have you. Um, and, and, and this is what I said when I went to a meeting and someone said to me, he said, no, you know, he said, if you want, it's just, if you want to stop, but you can't, he said, that's where the problem is. If you want to stop, but you can't, doesn't that tell you yeah, you're an addict. It's got the power over you. And I thought, well, yeah. He said, well, you've got you've got no power over it. Yeah, exactly right. You've got no power over it. He said, um, and that's where it is. Yeah, it's fucking scary, man. Like I still get chills and shivers, but I still think about. Of the, the last few, my podcasts have been quite deep about addiction, and but I still think about getting on it. I yeah. still think about like Christmas. Yeah, it's tough. It's a fucking tough time. Like I don't know why. Like we were out for Christmas Day family time, and I was looking around. And I'm thinking. They all look as if they're having fun. Yeah. At the start of the night. And then as like two or three hours passes, that you can see the change in people. You can mm. see the 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 louder and they're dafter and they think they're like, everything just becomes a mess. Their ties yeah. round the head, their Christmas hats are on, like shirts are on uh, like over the trousers, and you're thinking, look, like, fuck me, like it changes people dramatically. Yeah. I woke up in boxing day feeling good, went for a run and done a bit of shopping for the sales that. Like, it's just that few hours, which is the scary thing because we feel as if I'm missing something. That yeah. six hours of feeling good on alcohol gives you four or five days of misery because yeah. the hangovers are terrible. So instead of that six hours, just embrace the boredom and then you're going to have four or five good days good when other people are lying suffering. Like, it's just mad. Like, I think things are getting worse as well. I think more people are turning to drinking drugs. I think more people are turning to suicide. Suicide's at an all-time high yeah. and, it, and yeah. it's scary for individuals like... I just says there that thoughts I still get crazy thoughts and I question that and I think well have I really changed but I'm mm. not acting on those thoughts which is, yeah. is a, a major factor that I probably need to go back to a GA meeting in fact but just to get that extra bit of medicine and just kind of stay grounded because the, the thoughts have been there Yeah, but I'm not acting on them which is the main thing but you keep thinking about it and so you might have a, that one bad day and you might think fuck it yeah definitely you know I can uh, I can really connect with you there and, and that James because um, I I I I still struggle myself, um, but it's not sort of an, an instant thing now. I'm I'm becoming more of aware that it'll come weeks before, and I'll start feeling I'll start feeling low, or I'll start struggling with something and becoming irritable. Um, and I'll know, you know, it's it's coming. You know, there's there's there's, a, there's a, maybe a blip coming here, or you know, and it's it's time to act on that. Um, you know, and and we are gonna you know we are gonna fall off the wagons. You know, sometimes. You know what I mean? It's about um, it's about you know, you just gotta get back up on the horse, I suppose. If you do go that far, you know, and get get team meetings and and, and carry on. Yeah, I couldn't man. Like, one drink would just send me. Yeah. Everything I've created over the last three four years would just go upside down. Yeah. Like then people then don't take you serious, and go well you just fucked it. So how can you give advice? Like because there's a lot more pressure riding on these now because a lot of people watch this and take a lot. Of, for yeah. what you're saying yeah and realize like fuck me like i can change it yeah. gives people a little bit of belief that like, if i was to go in a, in a gaff and start boozing and taking gear me I, I just feel like an absolute fraud man everything yeah, yeah. i wouldn't i would just go hiding yeah i'd probably hide it for 
a few months. Yeah. But then people will start telling the telltale signs. You start getting aggressive and angry and you just, yeah, like meetings and stuff, I would I would stop showing up and yeah. I'd just become a fucking liar again. And yeah. It's scary, man. Yeah. It's a constant fucking good and evil battle. Yeah, like, of course, yeah. And I, and I, I always think, man, why am I still doing that? Why the fuck is that still there? But yeah. you're doing it for 20 years. It just fucking... It never goes away. No, it's just no. not to act on it, which is a scary thing. When did you start realizing? When did you start seeing yourself becoming a better individual? Um, probably within within weeks, really. Um, you sort of like started slowly started coming back to myself again. Um, you know, um, spending more time with my kids. You know, and it was sort of like. I realise, you know, as I, as I spent more time with my kids, I, I mean, I had, I had a young daughter at the time, she was only, um, she, she was two, um, as, I, as I sort of like put the, the drink and what have you down, um, and I just thought, wow, it was, it was just amazing how the bond sort of grew with her, um, and you know, and now, look at the bond with her, and it's, and it's spot on now, she's five, you know, she'll be, she'll be six in the summer, um, and just think, oh, I would never have had all this, um, but yeah, you know, you, you just sort of, um, you just sort of like feel it within yourself that you've come into the old, the old gym, you know, before, before the drinking drugs sort of like, you know, I think they bring you out, out, you know, they, they, they take away your own, your own true character. Um, and you sort of like, you know, you're acting out and you, you know, you're acting like a bit of an arsehole, a bit of a dickhead and what have you. Um, and I suppose when, when you sort of, you know, you realise, you know, you're being a bit more caring and, and you've, you know, you've got a lot to get, you know, a lot to give, a lot of love to give. I suppose that's when you sort of like realise, you know, that this is how, this is, you know, the true you, what, you know, how you're supposed to be, how you're meant to be. Yeah, it just strips you of who you're, you're destined to be. In. Yeah. And it's mad because we've all got great potential to be something great. Yeah. Like we've all got amazing, but belief, if you've got that belief that you can be something, you can yeah. be whoever the fuck you want to be and yeah. no matter what anybody says and when you start changing at the start, if you've been an asshole for so long, nobody believes that you're going to change. Yeah. Nobody fucking believes in, and when you start changing, you want to tell everybody, yeah. you kind of want to make amends with all the wrongs that you've done but nobody's interested because you've broken them down yeah. gradually, mentally, spiritually, fucking whatever because of the, the bullshit that you, you carried for so long and deflecting it onto other people because when you, you want to scream from the rooftops I remember I stopped for nine months and I was fucking just telling everybody this is amazing this is what you should do and I kind of was just pushing everybody away yeah. because like, who the fuck are you to say because you were a wanker for so long yeah. do you know what I mean and all you can do is just keep being you and yeah. it just uh, attract the right people into your life and you go through changes it's not for everybody I always touch on addictions but that's all, that's all I know it's all I can only speak yeah. from experience but it if it changes one life from a podcast or whatever then you're on the right path to yeah. for people just to plant those seeds and maybe see the world a bit differently and understand that you're not a big man by sitting in a gaff it's not in your brain out like, that ain't a tough man that's a weak man yeah. that's a loser mentality no matter where you look at it and you may have the baddest and biggest man in that gaff selling gear and taking it and he thinks he's big time he ain't big time give him five ten years and there's a good chance he might not even be here because you don't even know what you're fucking snorting now. No. It absolutely fries your brain, man. But the proper, the, I was just kind of getting out as the proper was hitting yeah. a few years back, man. And I, I remember that like, we used to get a bit of gear back in the day and it was 50 15. Used to rattle a quarter, a half ounce between a few of you. But then when the proper kicked in, the day, the, the two days, three days seemed to go for four and five. They seemed to yeah. have went fucking longer. Yeah. Whatever the fuck is in that shit. It's unbelievable, yeah. mate. You're absolutely flying out your nut. Don't speak. Everybody just sitting quiet. Yeah. yeah. And you're yeah. thinking, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> like, why would you do that? Yeah. When you yeah. actually, like, even thinking about it now, I think to myself, why? Yeah. All these guys sitting in a room, not saying fuck all. For days. For days. Just sitting bits of gear. Fucking some guy, some randoms got his shut off in a corner and your other guys are talking shit and your other people are just sitting tuned to the moon. And you're thinking, why? Yeah. Why? Mad curtain twitching and all sorts. And mm -hmm. it's just, it's meant that's addiction fire, isn't it? I suppose, you know, it's crazy. Why would you want to do that to yourself? You know, but like you say, when, when you're sat there, it's, you know what I mean? <laughs> and you know what, you know, the, the worst thing is when you keep going back, and I just keep going back, I knew what was coming. I knew what was coming. 
And it's just like you say, you sat there, you, you can't speak, and you think, why am I doing this? You know, a few days later, you, you, you're going to do it again. And you're yeah. thinking, why? It's fucking, it's madness. That's why they only call it the madness. Psychotic. It's fucking crazy. It's the, when the dry nose kicks in, you can't even snort anymore. Yeah. Daylights, your phone's off. You just, but then I used to always think about my kids. I used to always think about yeah. my family. I used to sit in the garth and think, wow. But it was all good at the time. Like the first six hours is fucking class yeah. because you're buzzing out your tits, man. Everybody's fresh. And then people start dwindling away and going home. I, I hated that. Mm. I fucking hated that. But because I knew I couldn't go home. Yeah. I didn't want to go home because I, I wasn't happy anyway. Yeah. But it's when people start going, you think, oh, no. Nah. And then you just get me a gear. Get a few hours more kip then try and get a kip then I'm back up, I'll feel fresh, maybe yeah. get a shower. But then three days passes and nothing's changed. Mm. Listen to the same music, talk about the same shit. Yeah. If I was to sit and get on it now, my friends would still be talking about doing the same, same cunts they would want to do 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. It's the same shite patterns, the same shite music, it's the same shit chat. Nothing changes. No. no. Unless you do. So even you started making the changes though and the adjustments, how good did you start to feel? How long did it take? Um couple of weeks really a few weeks you know what I mean um, started going out running getting the old the endorphins going and what have you started getting back in the gym um, and just being around people that, you know just being around different people you know what I mean out of that sort of like circle um, yeah and then you know it, it just sort of like spiralled from there um, carried on with the boxing and what have you um, and it, it got to the point you know after like 12 months and and you know, the lads from the football started, you know, getting on the phone to me and, and like you say, asking for a bit of help or a bit of advice. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was it was good to see, you know, to, to know that, you know, yeah, it has been noticed and that you can sort of like offer a bit of help. That's the, the mad thing. But again, to come out of the circle as well yeah. is difficult because people don't want you to come out of the circle and a little team and the brotherhood that yeah. you built up because then you think, People think you've turned on them yeah, because yeah. you want to change your life and better your life. And that's the fucked up thing. Yeah. People say you've changed. Good, because I wanted to change. I wasn't fucking happy. That yeah. If you can't support me for trying to make changes, then were you ever a friend? Mm. That's the way I look at it. But it's hard at the start because you're vulnerable and you're weak and you think you can't do it yourself. But to make changes, you need to do it yourself because nobody's on the same mission as you. Not everybody wants to change. No, that's it. Well, that's it. You've got, you've got to do it by yourself. You know, you've got to want it. You know, you've got to really want it. And, um, yeah, it's, you know, but you've got to have a vision in your head of where you want to be and the sort of person you want to be. Um, and you've, and, you know, you've, as hard as it is, you've, you've got to cut ties with people, you know. Um, like I say, I had, I had a really good, you know, really good bond with some, some of the lads from the football. Um, and yeah, it was, um, it was hard not to see them all, you know, and not be in that circle. But to be fair, there was, there was, there was sound lads, you know, me, they, are, they are my close friends, they are my brothers. Um, and they supported me, and they supported me through it, you know. Um, even sort of, you know, if they're having a bit of a night out, you know, I can go for a little bit of food with them. But then, you know, when it comes to such a time, I've got I've got, I've got, got to get off. I can't be around it, you know. It's, it, it's sort of like, you can feel the dangers coming on. So then, you know, and, and they're all right with that, you know. Because it feels normal. Yeah. It's just, for me now, I just don't do it. Yeah. I was at a Christmas night out, um, like a family and friends, kind of a couple of workers, and we had a Christmas night out a couple of weeks ago, and it was good, man. I had a wee dance and that for an hour, but 10 o'clock came, I just smoke bombed. Yeah. Everybody's, everybody's sheepish. Yeah. A lot of people watch my podcast as well, so nobody really says anything. Yeah. After a few drinks, about two or three hours, they're grabbing you and fucking want to know what that guest was like or this. Like, People just totally change. Yeah. And it kind of drains my energy. So I just kind of fuck off before it kind of gets to that level. Yeah. And, yeah. But sometimes I question it because you're around it all the smell of booze and seeing people having fun. Well, you think they're having fun, but it's, uh, I do think, would I be okay having a double vodka and coke? I, I yeah. still fucking think it. Yeah. And I go, shut up, you daft bastard. Like, yeah. But I still get those thoughts. So some, I don't go to these events often, but sometimes I like to fucking relax and, and yeah. spend time with people that I love yeah. but there's only a, a small majority of, because I know I know how weak I can be Yeah, and that's fucking and, I, and I'm still working on that and I'll always be working on that I'll probably be battling that forever Yeah, but I just know there's a lot of people on the sidelines want me to drink as well Yeah, because it. people that offer me gear and booze and I'm thinking what you can't yeah. why yeah. Why would you do that yeah yeah. you've got you've got to be on your guard I suppose um, and like you say 
you're just being aware of that danger. Um, do you know what I mean? Um, I mean, it is. It's hard. It's hard, especially when people are out and whatever. You know what I mean? And, and, and you'd like to you say you want to be out with the, you know the people that you love and enjoy it and everything. But at the same time, you're like, you know, you need to take a step back from it. You know what I mean? It's like um, you sort of like feel you you can feel the dangers of it, and you you know that feeling of uncomfortableness. Um, I suppose it's a good thing in real life. It's a warning. You know, you know it's it's not for you. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's sort of like. Um, Sort of like you don't guard from you, you know, for yourself to sort of like you know, as soon as you're feeling that uncomfortableness, you sort of like it's time to take a step back. And like you say, I'm the same, you know, I'm all right out for a little bit of time, and then when it gets to a certain time, you just want to get off. You want to just like you know, you've had enough. When did you come out the, the football side of things when you were going through the cupboard as well? Um, yeah, probably before, before a lot, well, just before I, I put it down, really. Um, so sort of like I say, I was on a banning order, and um, so I wasn't going. Um, and I just sort of like, I was that down and that depressed. I, I just, I wasn't mixing with anybody. So I wasn't really in no sort of like frame of mind to get out and to go near the football. So it's probably been like about, probably been about four or, about four or five years now, sort of like not being involved. Do you miss that? Um, not really. Um, now and again, the thoughts will come back because what's supposed to ever going to go away. You know what I mean? Same with the drinking the drugs. It's, it's another addiction. It's another addiction for me to football. So I don't suppose he'll go away, you know. And it is hard. It is hard sometimes. How would you feel that if you took your daughter to a match and and it just erupted with violence between fans, like and your daughter was in the middle? Of it, how would you feel genuinely? Yeah, I'd be, I'd be fucking fuming. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'd be like frightening. You know, obviously you don't want to take your kids and you know what I mean. See him, see him out. That's the thing, isn't it? Like mm. as much as it's people think it's a good thing, and boy, yes, yeah. that if other people get caught in the crossfire, that's where things need to make changes and go yeah. to my world. fuck it because I always thought like people it was like you watch the films and you think oh, they're all met in grass fields and they're just all yeah. jars like fucking 1600s mm. but it's not because they're just they're, they're still causing it everywhere yeah yeah definitely um, you know I remember one one uh, one fight we had um, and it always sticks in my head was um, it was in a bar in Manchester the bar got trashed um, and it went off um, and it was only afterwards you know, to realise there, there was fucking families in the bar, you know what I mean? Um, and they've had to get off out of the way because of that. And it's sort of like a fucking real shameful feeling, you know what I mean? Um, but like I say at the time, you don't see that, you've got the blinkers on, you're just seeing who's, who's stood in front of you. Um, so that's what I always say, you know, a lot of football lads will say, you know, it's no, no innocent people are there or whatever, but, you know, they, they, they fucking can be, like you say, you know, they can be. It's... Yeah. Um, and and it is a bit shameful that. See, when City started playing well, do you think a lot more people want to join these firms, or is it kind of just the same? Um, and your teams, yeah. your teams playing good or bad? It's probably yeah, it's probably just the same really. Um, it it goes up and down. I mean, I think um, it just depends sort of like who's on banning hours and what have you at the time. And a lot of lads will drop off, you know what I mean. And some of us younger lads will come through. It's just like um, constant conveyor belt really of just lads changing. You know what I mean. Like I say, a lot of lads get to a certain age and they sort of like knock it on the head. Um, other lads just sort of have to come away for it for themselves, or you know, and then it's just kind of like I say, constant conveyor belt. Different, you know, younger lads coming through want to get involved. Do you see a lot of that? A lot of people coming in and out because a lot of people I've spoke to just miss it. Yeah, and maybe in their fifties, sixties, and yeah, yeah. still fucking go to every game. But yeah. you can still see if a, if a fucking if it kicked off, they would still be there. Yeah, I yeah. believe anyway. No matter, like a lot of people, there's a lot of cameras now, and people are you get bigger sentences, but you can still see the passion in their eyes, like yeah, that fucking yeah. hunger and violence. That like, it's crazy. Man. It, it's just yeah. It's it's. Um, I don't know. Like I say, I, I can't really put my finger on it. What it is, it's just. Um, I suppose it's just something inside you, and it's it, it is like an addiction itself. You know what I mean? It's sort of like say it sparks something, and it's just. Um, you know, that instant fucking buzz that they get and do you know what I mean? It's um I suppose it's maybe a maybe it's some you know, a man thing, I don't know. Cause I mean, you know what I mean? That if you know, if it wasn't for the football, you know, it'd be going off somewhere else. There'd, there'd always be some sort of reason for, for men to go and fight, wouldn't there? Why do you think it's so popular though for like books and films? Like people do love that kind of stuff. Like, yeah, they do, I don't I um I couldn't tell you, I suppose, you know, it's 
football hooliganism with you know it's sort of like you know it's up there sort of like with the Italian mafia and, and you know what I mean like the British gangsters and sort of stuff you know what I mean it's just it's just something that catches people's attention as a though like, like, because yeah. every man does think they can fight yeah yeah and like you see I don't know there's like some kids you'll see trying on the Stone Island jackets now like <laughs> pretending to punch the mirror and fucking you know some videos I've watched and yeah People just think they're fighters. Yeah, People watch yeah. these films and genuinely think they're fighters. Yeah, like, yeah. It's a totally different ball game. I always thought I could scrap. I always thought I could handle myself. Like a 20 seconds on the street or in a pub is fuck all compared to a boxing match. And yeah. I realised that when I started really sparring. Like, I'm so off the pace here. Yeah. But fuck me, it's okay punching people. And But when you're in a ring, man, it's a pure talent and a craft. Like, I ain't a professional. I don't make out to be a professional, but I've still got the balls to get in fight and I would, can, I would I'll have another two fights yeah. next year not a fucking right. problem the money was okay man so yeah. why not and I enjoyed the, the fitness things yeah. I enjoyed the fucking fitness I enjoyed the the ruthlessness of the sparring like being scared but still pushing yourself to get in yeah. the spar you feel like a man you feel yeah. fucking I felt I felt fucking proud of myself like mm. I'm sparring these guys and I'm because oh, yo, everybody thinks they can break once yeah. you start taking a punch and realise you know what I'm fucking a lot harder than what I, I give myself credit for and yeah. then you kind of start enjoying it I fucking loved that like, yeah. have you always had the boxing background or was it just recently um, you get into it you, know, you sort of like I mean I went to the gym when I was younger boxing um, and it just it never, it never took off and it was sort of like sort of like my late 20s um, I just had like a few white collars and what have you and it was just a reason to get fit and also it kept me off the booze for a little while Um and, that, and it just sort of like spread from there really um, going into my 30s and what have you um, I had a few more and then it sort of like got into onto the, unla on the, the unlicensed scene um, and I had a, quite a bit of a following then you know what I mean the lads from the city had come um, I had a few other mates and what have you you know what I mean people from work had all come um, and it was just a good night out and um, and they had, and I'd done alright um, but it was only when um, I sort of like packed the bed in and, and, and I got fitter and I um, thought, you know what, I've, I'm, I'm doing all right. And everyone started to say, you know, you, you're all right. You know, if you if you put a bit of work in, you could go pretty far. Um, I didn't really realise how far I could go. Um, and um, it was only when sort of like, you know, it was mentioned, like, you know, I'll have a go at going pro, aren't you? you know what I mean? Maybe, you know, you, you've not got time on your hands now, but just have a go. Um, I got signed up and I went to the board. Um but the board knocked me back said, no, you know, you've, you've got no amateur experience, you know, we've not really just got to take this unlicensed stuff serious, really. Um, so um, I went and had a, a, a load of amateur, well, an handful of amateur fights um, in my mid-30s, um, which was mad and hard, you know, it's like going going on a boxing show there, to, you know, and it's like young kids on the show with you and what have you, you know what I mean? Um, and then, yeah, I decided to go, I felt right, you know, we had the, the lockdown and what have you, coronavirus it, so the boxing got put on hold, um, but I carried on training. Um, I went to the boxing board again. Um, I had a bit more luck with Sam. What was it like? Um, what's on? What's the unlicensed stuff like? Um, it's basically it's basically um, just white collar. So it's just white collar. Yeah. Um, but obviously the lads have got a bit more experience. Um, it's still only like three. You know, Three rounds, three three minute rounds, or you can know we had, we had ended up having a bit longer, ended up doing like six six rounds and what have you. Um, but again, it's not governed, you know what I mean? So you could, you know, you end up fighting a kid who's like four stone heavier than you sometimes. Yeah, you know what I mean? yeah. It can be a bit, can be a bit, um, mm -hmm. a bit dangerous, you know what That's I mean? That's the fucking thing. Like, I was I was doing eight rounds of three. Yeah. And then my fight was only three rounds, and I was fucked after the first round. I was flying yeah. eight rounds of three. Yeah. And I thought, man, this is a good intensity. It's, but on my fight night, it was a totally different intensity. Yeah. We were, I was main event, or co-main event, so I had like an extra four or five hours to wait. So the adrenaline must have been fucking pumping. And time, and my ring entries was seven minutes. Yeah. My yeah. coach, Andy McCart, was telling me everything's fucking percentages. He'd always shout him, everything's percentages. So we'd done the, 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 the way in, and obviously we come face to face. He says, don't fucking look away until he looks away. And obviously done that. He says, that's a small percentage. And then when we're in the ring, when we touch gloves, just put your gloves there, he'll touch yours. And then with the ring entrance, I was in second. So just make him fucking wait. Yeah. Because of the heat under the lights. Yeah, He yeah. kept telling me about it. And I'm thinking, I'll be fine. Like. But the time I got to the fucking ring, I was shattered. Yeah. And then the nerves started to get, because I was fighting in front of thousands. And, I, yeah. and it was my first fight. But I was fucking buzzing and I was proud that I'd done it. Yeah. Because I was the underdog. The kid I was fighting was... Um, 
younger, taller, stronger, had fights before. I'm and he looked obviously better shape than me. I was still going in a bit pudgy. Yeah. But I fucking done well, man. I, yeah. And I won. But it was uh, and I would de- do it again, man. Yeah. It was the buzz. It was the fucking buzz. And I kinda hurt a little after it though. Because people say you should be buzzing and I was buzzing for like the first hour. And then it kind of went away because I, I felt as if I had no more goals yeah, to yeah, achieve. Yeah. And I wanted to get a fight straight away because yeah. I, I train harder under pressure or when I know I've got a goal at the end. Did you find that after each fight? Did you want to constantly yeah. get another one? Yeah, um, different. Like, especially in the early days when I was still drinking and what have you. Like, you sort of, because um, as soon as I had my fight, I was back on the bay. Um, and it was sort of like, it was it was sort of like a bit of a medicine to, to keep me sober. But um, yeah, def- definitely now. Um, did, you know, there's, um, when you know there's a goal, um, and like you say, the buzz of getting in there, do you know what I mean? The buzz of getting in there and, and like you say, there's nowhere to hide in there. There's nowhere to hide, you know, it's not, um, you know, you're not in the street or in a pub or anywhere else, you know what I mean? There's, there's just two men there, you know, and, you know, the added pressure of having fucking hundreds and thousands of people watching you. Um, but it all adds to the buzz of it, doesn't it? You know what I mean? It all adds to the buzz, you know, um, especially if you get the win. Yeah. yeah. But I've got a newfound respect for anybody that goes under those ropes and has a tear up. Like, yeah. I used to watch boxing and think, I, or I used to hit the pads and think, man, I could knock anybody out. And yeah. and then you watch boxers and you think, man, I could fucking batter him. And then you spar yeah. and you realise that pads don't move. Yeah. So yeah. try to land a punch while somebody else is moving. It, it's a it's pure craft. Yeah. No matter if you're an amateur or a professional, that like, how these guys can go twelve rounds is fucking unbelievable. Yeah. It's unbelievable that the, the fitness of it. Everybody, I believe, should genuinely, at least in their life, have one fight. Yeah. And get a taste of it and. They would have more respect for the people who fucking do it. Like, yeah. Def- uh, because I used to judge it. You get those armchair people sitting fucking yeah. full of pizzas and sitting in their underpants just giving advice. Like, everybody thinks, I believe everybody thinks they can fight. Yeah. But until you're in those fucking, in that ring where it's yeah. a lonely journey, yeah. you can get embarrassed, your pride gets dented. Like, I probably lost the majority of my sparring sessions because the kids I was fighting was, was younger, mm. sharper, and it fucking humbles you. And I'm thinking, man, I used to sit outside sometimes the training and I was ready to text, say, fuck it, I'm not going coming in tonight or make an excuse. But I used to force myself to go because I knew I had a fight. Yeah. I need to fucking learn the craft. And yeah. every time, after the, after four weeks, then it just become natural. I started to enjoy getting hit. I didn't mind that because I realised, okay, man, I can take a dig. Yeah. But that's, and it, but that's a bit psychotic as well. I used to question that. Because I started to, I fucking genuinely started to enjoy it. Yeah. I enjoyed it. I, I didn't mind letting the first round getting a few digs in because yeah. I, I felt as if it was toughening me up. Yeah. I fucking enjoyed it, man. That's a that's a mad thing. Did you enjoy getting hit as well? Or was that just me? Yeah. No, I, I, I do enjoy some sparring sessions as well, yeah. You know what I mean? Um, it's just, it's just, I suppose, it's, you know, it's been in that fight, you know, that fight, you know, where, did, I know, some of the best fights I've had, you know, is where, um, it's just, you know, real slugfest, you know what I mean? It's really gone, you know, to the, to the depths where, you know, you, you're both knackered and you just, you know, you've got to dig deep and go for it. Um, I, don't, I don't know if there's anything psychotic in it. I don't know. I suppose, you know, we're, we're animals, aren't we? Yeah. We're animals and maybe it's just sort of like that 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 uh, man thing, I suppose. You know what I mean? Um, That's a fucking mad experience, isn't it? He's great, mate, yeah. <laughs> I'll do another one. I, really like, I thought I trained hard. I didn't. I, I thought I did. I was training three times a day. Yeah. But now I know the extent. I wasn't to be blown after the first round, man. I'm thinking, what the fuck happened? It's just nerves, lights, everything. The, yeah, a lot of it. Nervous energy. Yeah. You can um, you, you can get that. You can get, I've had that where I just sort of like felt I was blowing and I was unfit, but it's, you can be over, over it, you know, over nervous. Yeah. And, and you know what I mean? Um, it's just about calming down I suppose isn't yeah, it I wish I'd have probably got into that when I was younger instead of football I think I would have had more discipline Yeah, I think I'd have been more disciplined I think I'd have been a lot sharper mentally Yeah, because you know it's totally night and day from boxing the exercise to drinking and taking gear like, it's two sides of the spectrum like, yeah. like the feel good factor to then the misery yeah. suicidal like you don't get that no. in the boxing training like you feel alive that's the most alive yeah. I've felt in 37 years like yeah. I felt fucking amazing yeah. my ideas were fresh I, I was bang on it my, all my clothes started to fit confidence started to rise and after my fight I thought I'm not going to go back into old habits but sure as fuck I did because I felt as if I'll, I'll have a week off that week's turned into three months Yeah, 
And I've, <laughs> I've seen, right, okay, man, let's get the shit back together again. Every podcast, my week is up and fucking down. Yeah. I want to kind of maintain it, man. I want to kind of feel good and enjoy it. And that's when I felt at my best when I was doing the boxing for eight weeks, nine weeks. That like, I felt amazing. Like that exercise, that pushing yourself to the extreme is doesn't make you want to drink mm. because you're feeling so good that you don't want to go and fuck it. I believe that was yeah. me personally, but yeah. I don't know how you deal with that. But did you think feel that as well when you're training? That like? yeah, it's it's, um, it's sort of like uh, it's, it's a natural good, it's a natural goodness, good chemicals, it's a natural yeah. good chemicals. You know, your endorphins and what have you. And like I said, there's nothing better even. Um, you get up in the morning and you go for a run, you know, you feel miles better that day than just, you know, rolling out of bed and cracking on. It's just getting, you know, it's, it's just about, the, you know, the the, uh, the feel-good factor. Um, and I don't think there's, there's, there's any other any other way, really, than, yeah. you know, keep yourself looking after yourself, eating the right stuff as well. Um, you know, even now, if, um, like, you, you'll notice yourself after your camp, you know, if you vet, you vet well and then you sort of, like, eat a bit, a bit of shit afterwards, you feel shit. Yeah. You feel shit. You are what you put in you, you know. I know I am... Um, just sort of like when I turned pro, um, I started dealing with a nutritionist um, and it's like crazy, you know, there's like, it's, it's the science around everything, you know what I mean? You know, what you put in you um, to make you feel good and and it, and it, it is, it's true, you, you know, you are what you eat, you know, you put yeah. shit inside you, you feel shit. Yeah. I mean, I, I, like now Christmas now, I've just had a bit of shit like over the last few days, you're like, you're like you feel it, you feel pudgy, you feel shitty and tight, you know, you feel tired. You know what I mean? But when you're up, when you're up running, you're eating healthy old porridge for your breakfast and you're eating loads of fruit, you know, you, you feel on the bar completely, you know. Yeah, you've got that extra buzz, man, that got, extra kick, that, yeah. the extra chemicals that you need to kind of take mm. away and block out the pain. Like, that's the beautiful thing about it. How was it for you turning pro in your late 30s? Um, yeah, it was, it, it's a bit mad. I mean, a lot, I mean, a lot of people told me, said, you know, you, you, it's too late for you. And I got told that constantly. It's too late. Um, but the addicts inside me wouldn't have that, you know what I mean? I was I was addicted to the boxing now. Um and it just sort of like drove, you know what I mean? That yeah. that, that was my new addiction. Um and I just sort of believe I've come that far um that I have got to carry on. I've got to carry on. And, and it's sort of like and I had this I did have this vision in my head that I was gonna have a professional fight, you know what I mean? Even if it was just the one, I didn't care. I just wanted to get in that ring as a pro. Um so yeah, and it was a it was a long um, it was a long process. It took like it was over two years for me to get there, really. You know what I mean with the board and the, and you know with the coronavirus and all that kicking in, and then they had to have assessments and what have you. But yeah, to get in there, it was it was it was massive. So where do you go from it from here? <laughs> from here? Um, well, I'm not I'm not sure yet. You know what I mean? I'm just I mean when I first start when I first before my first pro fight, which you know I lost I lost my first fight. Um, you know the big build up and then um, I ended up getting dropped in the first round so you know like you say it was like a real fucking come down you know what I mean it's sort of like wow it was, and it was an hard, hard pill to swallow that um, but won my second fight um, so just looking forward to the year ahead now hopefully get a couple more wins um, you know when I first when I first got my licence I had a vision that I could maybe fight for the area title you know who knows where that'll go but um yeah, just I'm just gonna keep on enjoying it and just you know, hopefully you know I keep fighting up until I'm forty maybe. See how I, see how I feel then. How was it then? Oh, the build up, changing your life, first professional fight, and then getting put in your ass the first round. But ah, uh, it was like um, it was like it just won't you know it wasn't meant to be that you know the, the fairy tales of the story. I was meant to come out and have me win and fucking you know, I had I had you know, hundreds of people there. You know what I mean. The, the noise in the, in the in the arena was echoing. You know what I mean? I was singing my name. It was like fucking hell, you're brilliant coming out on this big stage. And then a few minutes later, I've been fucking dropped. I'm like, it was um, just wanted the fucking world to swallow me up. It was horrible. It was horrible. It took me um, took me days to sort of like get me around it. You know what I mean? But um, you know, I was, I was talking to people and what have you. But um, someone said something, and it sort of like it home. He said, "Aren't you know?" Your story, all the bumps that you're having the road, you know, there's always something you've got to jump over an hurdle. He said, this is just another hurdle. And it's sort of like, that gave me a fucking bit more belief in myself. But you know what? Yeah, just get back up, get in the fucking gym again. And let's get the next one on. Um, and I went out, um, I think it was about seven weeks later, I got the win. So, Did it make you think about going back on the gear or the booze at any point? Um yeah, definitely um sort of like 
I suppose that 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 in the in the back of my head will probably always be my, my go to when things get hard. That's your sort of like your go to. Um, and yeah, it was sort of like I was I was um, was a bit down after it. Yeah, um, but I suppose the fight in me. What I thought? No, you know what? I've got to put this fucking right. I need to put it right. Who was it when in the your second fight? It was a, like a relief more than anything. Um, just a relief that you know managed to get you know get a win. Um, like I say, after the you know, afterwards now probably it's probably just it's still there niggling that defeat's probably still there niggling inside. But um, but yeah, I just relieved that I got the win as a professional boxer. You know what I mean? At at thirty eight, you know what I mean? It's um, I suppose it's still still a pretty good achievement. Definitely for where you've came from, the brink yeah. of suicide to then fucking fighting pro that's unbelievable yeah. like, yeah. why do you get sparked in the first round and then come back and win like that's all part of your process that like, yeah always hitting obstacles and that's where you find out who you really are when the defeats come yeah because like you say we can hide behind the booze and the gear because we don't want to face it but to stand up and then kick on that's you facing it and then yeah. the pain doesn't can you imagine you quit yeah after yeah. that yeah never getting to taste the, the victory but yeah. that's what happens people quit because they taste the defeat and they don't like it yeah but you're not, everybody tastes defeat. Yeah. That's the most successful people have tasted defeat the most. They've just not let it fucking defeat them or quit. They've just not let it give up. And that's the, the majority of people in the world. And now people just giving up left, right, and centre because they think there's no way out. There's always hope, man. There's always yeah. a way out. It's yeah. down to the individual. That, when's your next fight? Um, looking at maybe April. Um, in Where? Manchester, Manchester bowlers, I'll Manchester. Come. Yeah, yeah, come, down, yeah. come bro. <laughs> Definitely, <laughs> yeah, don't let down. me down, bro. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> I've got plenty of time to shame for it. So, so yeah. Hopefully, April at bowlers. What weight you think that? Um, a fight sort of like super middleweight. Um, but me, it just varies. I can go up to like heavyweight as well. So it's twelve. Was that twelve? But, two, 12 between, but between between twelve and twelve and a half stone, yeah. It's fucking, it's, it's knockout punches, but that way, and that when you get well, connected yeah. with a fucking peach, man, it's, it's good night, man. Yeah, yeah I always fight with head guards on, and I, I still felt fucking digs. Yeah, because we everybody agreed not to fight head guards, fight no head guards, of course, man, big man. I don't yeah. want to fight head guards, but health and safety kicked in because we're not uh, professionals or fuck all. Yeah, it was uh, the rules, but I'm fucking glad now. Yeah, I'm fucking glad, man. Like, it's, I still got. You still get dizzy, you still get the flashes sometimes when you get cracked, man. Like you spar with head guards on? Yeah, we spar with head guards and, and like you say, the big the big sixteen ounce gloves. Yeah. Um but yeah, it's different when you're getting in there and you're fighting with ten ounce and there's, there's, there's nothing in them for them pro gloves. <laughs> there's absolutely nothing in you and you, no and, you and, and you feel it, mate. Yeah. yeah you're fucking right, you do, aren't yeah. it? You you your family and that, your kids and that must be proud then you've made the changes. That's the main thing, like, isn't Yeah, it? yeah. Uh, I mean both the girls probably don't really they've never really seen the sort of like me at, at my worst you know what I mean they probably won't remember um, which is a good thing which is a good thing really you know what I mean they'll never see that um, and like I say you know the, the bond with my youngest is, is, is brilliant you know what I mean she's a proper daddy's girl it's great you know what I mean she wants to see man there's no, there's no better feeling than you know doing the running out and you know and you can become up and what have you uh, my lad he's coming up to 15 he, he has seen me at my worst um, I sort of I, I've always had a good bond with him, even sort of like in my, in my darkest days. Um, and I don't know whether it's sort of like a kid thing because he's pretty resilient, aren't he? And he's sort of like, maybe, I don't know whether he maybe shuts a lot of it out or he doesn't remember. Um, but he has, he has seen, you know, the turnaround in me. Um, and it's just, I just hope it can sort of like influence him as well to go the right way. Is um, he a City fan? He's a City fan as well, yeah. So you go to the games? Yeah, took him to, uh, took him to the game the other night against Leeds, yeah. It might be in his blood though to go down the route you went down through not maybe the alcohol and the drugs but the fighting side of things because his dad our kids are a reflection of us yeah do you know what I mean like, absolutely yeah how would you feel um uh, you know I'd be, I'd be gutted really you know um I can see I do see it in him you know what I mean I see it you know like his eyes are light up especially if I take him out you know what I mean and all like, see all the boys in the pub and they're like oh you know what I mean and you might tell him a few stories about your dad and what have you you know what I mean and it's like, yeah, but that's, you know, that's 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 that son, you know what I mean? Just, you know, and I, I take him in the gym and that with me now, you know, try and get him on the sort of like bit of fitness and what have you. So it's, it's like you say, but it's good that I suppose I've had that experience um, and that can maybe yeah. keep him keep him a bit grounded, direct him in the right, you know, push him in the right path. But probably more chance of him doing that if you were still drinking and taking gear, do you know what I mean now? Yeah. On a clean, clean path, maybe could go down 
the fitness route and trying to be as strong as natural as possible man like I always say this but our kids are a reflection as they do yeah. follow in our footprints no matter if it's good or bad like, like you say he's earlier you've seen a reflection of your mum and you yeah do you know what I mean like if you're going down the box and turning pro and being fit and healthy hopefully that then ingrains into your son that that's the route he can go down because we can only raise our kids to a certain level mm -hmm. and teach them for what it teach you can raise your kid the best in the world but they can meet certain people or go down certain paths and it takes them down to a, a darker road that you don't want to happen but fingers crossed that the, our kids your kids do make the right decisions yeah no thank you yeah <laughs> yeah and hopefully the kids can make well, we give them enough knowledge to know what's right for wrong know what's right and wrong do you know what i mean yeah definitely yeah how is it then like being away from everybody do you feel it's a lonely journey making changes and try to become a better individual yeah definitely um you know these times where um like you say you know you feel like you're missing out and like you've just, just sometimes i feel like i've cut myself off from the world um and it's sort of like even even now you know i'm still still at the beginning of this journey you know what i mean there's still massive mistakes i still see the old me coming out spilling out at times you know what i mean um my temper can flare up and become irritable um so yeah it's just i think it's you've got to learn you know you've got to learn and sort of like dig deep and you know i, I believe now you've got to you know try and be as spiritual as you can and, and try and go down that path and you know learn about yourself and um it's about being the best version of yourself um and it you know it doesn't come overnight i suppose you got you know it's, con it's a constant um it's a constant work in progress yeah when do, what triggers you the most where do you find your trigger points um it could be a number of things really this is this and it's like i say this is far part about learning about yourself um it could be anything it could be sort of like if i'm feeling a little bit down um you know trying to find out what sort of like makes me down you know what i mean it can that can sort of like it can quickly feel like a nose dive like i'm i'm, I'm crashing down again um sort of like you know if i've not seen my kids for a while you know what i mean if it's been a week or so that can sort of like make you feel a bit lonely um you know anything really you know that, that little argument with somebody can sort of like trigger you you know what i mean i don't think that's the hard thing to really change is to go right in deep and get the rooted yeah the rooted problems that it's okay to have a bit of fire and a bit of aggression but as long as you're channeling the right way instead yeah. of the the proper violence like yeah. you go full steam ahead and then you're just going to be full of regret and hate again yeah and there's a good chance you slip back into old habits like yeah that's not what you want to do like, it's fucking difficult though because you always be tested every day you're tested yeah yeah it just depends what kind of mood you're in and how you want to react to it that's why everything's to do with your reaction yeah definitely yeah and like you say you know um you know, I'm, nobody's perfect, and and you know, at the day we are all humans, and 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 I still I still have the problems now. Um, so like you say, it's about continuous work. I remember one of the um, one of the early days when I was going in recovery, um, and I was saying like, you know, why 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 is it that I'm you know I'm carrying on like this? And they said, you know, that's not the problem. The problem's with you, not with the drinking the drugs. That's just your solution. It's the same with the football. You know, that's just your solution. You know, it's your, your little escape. Of, you know getting out of the way you're really feeling so suppose you know somewhere along the lines you're gonna have to sort of like deal with you know the real emotion inside you and what it is that's triggering all this sort of you know fucking addiction and 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 the violent tendencies and what have you did you ever go and see like any psychologist or therapy no no not at a minute no um i've not i mean i've done i've just sort of sort of like kept on the path of recovery and what have you um probably not as much as i need to really um to sort of like you know get deeper you know deeper to the root or what have you um but i suppose that's that's one for the future that'll be good sort of like good to sort of like yeah. jump on that that's what something i've been talking about the last few weeks is yeah to go and see a therapist and i think i'm in a good place i feel as if i'm in a good place i'm doing the right things but i feel as if i start a lot a routine that shows that yeah i've never really discussed or i've never disclosed to anybody if i'm honest like there's a lot of stuff i'll take to the grave and that's just the way it is but I'd like to really speak to somebody and just fucking put it and figure it all out because I feel as if I should be figuring it out myself mm. and that's the wrong reason sometimes because I can preach all this shit but I can live in from experience but there's a lot of stuff that I don't know mm. and that and I'd like to really work on it and find out right you know what I want to release that but it's scary because it becomes a, a trust thing to be yeah. then pouring out to somebody you don't really know mm. and it's that's the nerve-wracking thing but to, to truly heal is to talk about it and accept yeah. it 
to then move on from it. Going forward for the future, brother, what's your plans? Uh, well, hopefully, um, I just been talks about hopefully getting a getting a book a book deal, getting a book out, so I like you know, um, so that's that's in the early stages. Um, continue with me, um, with me, with my boxing career. Hopefully, take that as far as I can get, and then, um, yeah, I suppose I'm gonna have to start making some plans. I think um, what I like to do is sort of like do some maybe reach out works. You know, people that are struggling. Um, I think that's where I think that's where sort of like my future future lies. You know what I mean? So people like the is up, you know what I mean? It's never the end, you know what I mean? Um, like you say, you've just touched on the suicides. Um, I remember reading something a few weeks ago um, about people having suicidal thoughts. It was like, um, you know, um, you don't really want to die. You just want the pain you're in now to end, you know? And it's, 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 um, you know, it's, it's sort of like that sort of, that sort of thing. And I, I know, I, I do believe that not a lot of people, you know, a lot of people just be out of its ending and, and end their own life when, you know, They've not really, you know, it's just, just about hanging on, I suppose. Just hanging on and just fighting on. And, um, you know, because you never know what's around the corner. You never know what lies ahead. Yeah. For anybody that's battling with addiction just now, what advice would you give for them, Tony? Um, just just go and get the help. Go and get, um, you know, get yourself to an AA meeting, CA meeting, NA meeting, any sort of 12-step meeting, you know, speak about it. Because um, the help is there, the help is there, and, it, and it's free. You know what I mean? Don't cost you, don't cost you anything to go. Um, so just go there and you know it'll be the best thing you've ever done yeah it's just taking that first leap but just got to take it yeah knowing it's going to change your life for the better knowing you yeah. is to understand that you're not alone because we'll battle these demons and, and whatever fuck it is we're going through and we don't really talk about it but not talking about it just burns deeper and deeper and deeper yeah. and a bigger depression and you know fine well yourself that the drink and the drugs is just purely to escape the, the fucking madness in your mind yeah not realising some people don't realise until it's too late. Yeah, definitely. Like we've been blessed that we've seen the light and yeah. try to keep working on myself. It's not fucking easy. Definitely not easy. Not, I used to think the more successful I become, the easier it'll be, but the kind of the harder it's becoming. Yeah. yeah that's more <laughs> tests and it's fucking mad. Like, no matter how much money or how many views I get, it's still, there's just more pressure, added pressure comes yeah. on to you and that's just life. But as long as I'm not acting on it, as long as you're not acting on it, and people watching can understand that if they too can change, or anybody can, ch anybody can make yeah, changes. Like that. A lot of people see you now, and you, you, if you're looking well and doing well, they can't really see what you were like in the past. They can't yeah. really understand that. But if they seen you, they'd be like, "Fuck me!" Like, okay, I understand now. That like, yeah, it's mad to think that like, how you can just sit in a boozers and then go back to a party and just waste away. But everybody makes choices, and if I never made those mistakes, I wouldn't. Have educated myself on life yeah and try to help others now same as yourself that like, you want to do this and try and guide others not to go down the same route you yeah. went down that like, we wouldn't be able to do that if we'd never done the shit that we've done no definitely and um do, do you know as mad as it sounds i've um i've said for a while now i'm grateful for the experience that i've that i've, that I've had um because without them like you say we won't be the people that we are now you know what i mean um I think you need to feel that pain. You need to feel that pain and that rock bottom to sort of like turn it around. You've got, you know, and it's it's that loneliness and that, you know, that heartache um, that'll trigger you. Um, because without that, you know, if there's always someone that's going to like look after you like me, who's my nana, you know, she's always, you know, it'll be all right and, you know, and I was getting looked after. So without that, I don't think um, a lot of people struggle to sort of like turn it around. Um, because yeah, it's definitely got to come with yourself, got to come in from, from yourself. Yeah, definitely. Would you like to finish up on anything, brother? No, mate, I think um, I think that's it, mate, yeah. Yeah, listen, good, yeah. you're doing amazing. Yeah. yeah keep I'll, up the good work. Thanks, James. I'll beat your fight in a yeah. few months, bro. Drop one, pal. Appreciate it, mate. Thanks a lot, pal.